So today we're going to be having a little more interactive sermon where thankfully I have some willing victims, uh, volunteers, some of our young people, they graciously said they would come and help me with the sermon. And uh, to start off, we're going to open our Bibles and uh, to Matthew chapter 22. So let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. And this is a familiar story to probably most of us, if not all of us. If it's not, then I hope you enjoy as we read this, this beautiful story that Jesus told about a wedding feast. And uh, as we read through this story, I know some people are able to just read the story and they can picture this in their mind and they're able to, to glean um, the message that God is, is sharing to them through the passage. But some people are a little more hands-on and practical and they like to, to see it visually before them. And that's what we're going to try to do today. It's not, we're not going to be putting on a big drama or a skit because none of these kids have ever done this before. This is their first. This is the dry run right here and now. And we're just going to try and work through the story and bring out a few of the, pa- uh, the key points that Jesus highlighted in this passage. So in Matthew chapter 22, the Bible says in verse 1, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Now, Lockie has graciously said he's going to be my servant today. So, Lockie, you can come right on up here. And I uh, see that microphone down there, Lockie. Could you grab that microphone? Ah, thank you. I was getting tired of bending over. Isn't he a good servant? Well done. Thank you, Lockie. Now, Lockie, he's going to go and invite some people to the wedding feast that uh, the king is, is, is prepared. As you see, we have all have it prepared over here. We have the table, we have the seats, but we have no guests. And we want God's table to be full. God wants His heavenly banquet table to be full, so we need to send out the invitation. Now, I have some pre-assigned people in the audience. Lockie, you don't know who they are. But they're going to wave their hands now. And uh, you can go and invite them. So Mutsa, she's your first one. Will you go down and invite Mutsa? And she's going to read something to us. So Mutsa, will you please come to the banquet table? Oh, we'll just wait. We got the cordless mic on. Yeah, it should be good now. I wrote a piece of ground. Whoa, sorry. Let me flick the switch. Lou said, uh, uh, sorry, Lou, I was supposed to flick the switch. It was here. There it is. There, they were here. Thank you. I bought a piece of ground, and I must go see it. I ask you to have me excused. Okay, thank you. So, Lockie, we haven't had any luck yet so far. We sent out the invitation to invite these people to the wedding feast, and Mutsa says, I've bought a piece of ground. I need to go have a look at it, and I can't come. I can't come. Now, there's many people that have made excuses in their life for their reason of coming to God. Some, they've used wealth. They've used their riches as a reason of saying, hey, I don't have time. I'm too busy making money. I don't have time for God. Maybe when I'm old, maybe when I'm an old person in the rest home, then I'll be able to have time to sit down and finally sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So Mutsa, she has sadly refused the invitation now, Lockie, can you go and invite Cooper to see if Cooper will come to, not Cooper, Chris. Invite Chris. Cooper's later. I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Oh. <laughs> Women. They get to all of us, don't they? At least the men in the room. People, they use many, many excuses. Even down to Relationships that they're unwilling to surrender their life to God of how and reason why that made, in fact, someone else in their family, maybe their spouse, maybe their partner, maybe their children, maybe their parents. They say, I can't come. I can't come to the wedding feast because my family, they won't accept me. Many are called, but few are chosen. God is calling all, and there is no excuse that's too great or too big 
to ignore the wedding call feast that God is wanting us to be at this banquet table in heaven. Thank you, Lockie. We're going to invite one more person, but I'm thinking they're going to have an excuse, and it's Kirsten. Yes. I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excuse. Oh, thank you, Lockie. You can actually come and sit in this special chair here. Now, we'll, we'll come back to you later. Kirsten, she's full of excuses. She's bought yoke of oxen. She doesn't have time. Using her work that I can't follow God. I can't follow his way. My, my employment doesn't allow me. Please, God, excuse me. I, I can't come. We're full of excuses. And you guys remember singing that little song as kids? I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused, I cannot come. We are full of excuses. But God is persistent in his gospel message to send out. His banquet table must be full. Lockie, how many are sitting at our table? None. We need the table to be full, don't we? Let's keep reading. In Matthew chapter 22, and in verse... Um, Matthew chapter 22... Uh, continuing on with verse 4. And then again, he sent out the servant saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared for my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calf are killed. And all things are ready to come to the wedding. But they all made light of it, and they went their own ways, one to his farm and another to his business. And they said, Please, please excuse me. Please excuse me. Now, I want to speak to the ladies in the room in just a casual way at the moment right now. If I was to invite you to a really special banquet tomorrow, what might be your excuse? What might be your excuse? What's that? Is it vegetarian? Okay. All right. Margarita, she wants to make sure it's vegetarian. No. They've put the pig on the spit. Margarita's not coming. Okay. Yes. Yes, vegetarian. And I'm with Margarita. That's awesome. You know, God has instructed us with, with, with the health principles founded in the Scripture. And uh, that might be an excuse. Hey, eh, may not have anything that I can eat. But could it, be, could it be crossing your radar, ladies, that you might give the excuse to say, I can't come because I don't have anything to wear. Would that be an excuse for maybe not going to a fancy dressed up party. I have nothing to wear. See, God, He's removed every excuse for us to come to the banquet table. If you look what it says with me in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation 3 and verse 18. Revelation 3 and verse 18, it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and to anoint your eyes with eyes of that you may see. God counsels us to buy of him gold refined in the fire, to buy of him white raiment. How are we to buy this white raiment? I'm broke. How are we to buy? And that's, that's our desperate condition. If you go to me in Isaiah, go with me to Isaiah chapter 55, 55 and verse 1. The prophet Isaiah says, Ho to everyone who thirsts, come to the waters that you may, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. God is promising us, saying, hey, yes, it's okay. You can come by even if you don't have money. And the reason why that we can come to the banquet table, even if we don't even have a robe to wear, a wedding garment, is because the table has been set, the meal has been prepared, everything has been paid for on God's account. Everything has been set on God's account, even our clothes, even our robe. And so our, the excuse that I have nothing to wear... God says, I have provided a robe, a banquet robe for you to come. Please, please come to my banquet feast. 
So, Lockie, can I get you to invite uh, uh, Tui? Now, you can just go, and Tui's way in the back there. Can you go and take him this? Oh, I'm going to help you out a little bit here. I got this special bag here with some things in it. Now, can you go to Tui and say, Tui, can you come to the banquet table? You can just take him that cloth. I'll take the mic. You go to Tui and then have Tui come. He's, he's right down the back there. He's hiding, but he's there. You go ahead. That's good. We need to go into all the lands to invite people to come to the banquet table. Now, Tui, will you please come to the heavenly banquet table? He's making the decision. Yes. Now, he said he would come earlier. Are you still going to come, Dewey? Oh, please come. We must compel them to come to the banquet feast. Please come up here. Thank you, Lockie, for sending the invitation. Thank you for responding, Dewey. So, yep, come right on up here. And let's make sure you have that robe. Let's put on that robe. Now, this is a special, special robe. It's white. And you just pop your head through there. Excellent. And you can find a seat at the table. You're, well, you're ready. You're dressed and fit for the banquet. Thanks, Lockie. Very good. Yep, yeah, you can sit back down there. As we've studied in Scripture many times before, and it's the theme of many a sermon, is that we are saved by faith in Christ alone. And I like what Martin Luther says. It says, we are saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone, in that it has a result. And so through faith, Dewey has received the righteousness of Jesus to cover him. He's received that robe of righteousness, and he's fit, and he's ready to come to the banquet table. But I love this quote in Christ's Object Lessons. It says, righteousness is right doing, and it is by their deeds that all will be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. The works show whether the faith is genuine. So yes, Dewey has had faith in Jesus, has had faith in the sacrifice of Christ. And his atoning blood has covered him of all his impurity, of all his sin. But because he has received Christ into his life, the natural result is righteous works, isn't it? That is the test of faith. That is the result of genuine faith is that Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ is lived out through your life. Thank you, Tui, for receiving Jesus and coming to the banquet table. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7, Revelation 19 and verse 7, It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Who is the lamb in this text? Jesus. Who is the wife? His church, his people, those that he has called and invited to the wedding feast. They have made, this wife has made herself ready. How has she? It says, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. See, this wife that has made herself ready for the wedding feast has received Christ into her life. Now, Lockie, can I get you to go and invite Jessica? Jessica's right here. Say, will you come to the wedding feast? Now, before you do that, could you grab one more robe from the bag? You can take and, and go and invite Jessica to come to the wedding feast. Yes, excellent. You just go down there and say, please come to the wedding feast. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Jessica, for responding to the invitation. Come right up here. Let's get you dressed for the wedding. This is a very, very special feast. Oh, and this is a very special robe. You see, this robe, it's not made from just any old fabric. Isn't that, oh, that, you look good. Why don't you go and have a seat at the banquet table? Is that these robes, what it costs for these robes to be made 
is that Christ, he willingly stepped off his throne into heaven. He says, oh, Jessica, now, and, and Dewey, they're, they're pretty bad, but I love them. And I'm willing to take their place in dying for their sin because the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin, it is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. It is that robe of righteousness. And thankfully, Jessica and Dooley, they have believed in Jesus and believed in his sacrifice and they've accepted that robe of righteousness to cover their life and they too can have a seat at the wedding table. And when we receive, as it says here, that this white robe in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8, this fine linen, it is the righteous acts of the saints. And of course it is. Because when we receive Christ into the life, the fruit of that it is. It is righteous acts. You know, when I was uh, back in Canada, there's a, a beautiful place that I can take you. It's up on Bell Mountain. It's spelt B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's actually a French word. Bell. Now, do we have any French-speaking people in the audience? What does Bell mean? Beautiful. It's beautiful mountain. Bell. That's right. And uh, you go up on Bell Mountain, and out of the ground, there's this perfect little hole in the ground. And coming up out of the, of the ground is crystal clear mountain fresh water. And you can get down on your hands and knees and you can just stick your face into the water and just slurp it up. And it's delicious. Beautiful, fresh, clean water. Bad things cannot come out, or uh, unclean things cannot come out of a clean thing. Impure water can't come out of a clean spring. And so it is in the life when we've received Christ into the life and we allow His righteousness to fill us, to cover us, and to saturate us. Righteous acts, as it says, the righteous acts of the saints, they will follow. They will follow. And often we like to switch that around, that before I come to Christ, I need to make sure that I'm walking the walk before and talking the talk. But we need to be receiving Christ and let Him do that refining and purifying work in our life. And righteous acts, they will follow. They will follow. Continue on in Matthew chapter 22. From verse... Um, from verse 7 it says, When the king heard about it, that is, those that did not receive the wedding invitations or that ignored it, he said he was furious, and he sent out his armies to destroy those murderers and to burn up their city. But it says, then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who are invited, they were not worthy. What makes a guest worthy of coming to the banquet table? The previous guest that says, I can't come. I bought a, a field. I bought some cows. I've married a wife. They were not worthy. But what makes an individual worthy to come to the banquet table. Well, let's do a little verse study here, a little word study from the scriptures. If you go to Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was instructing the, the 12 disciples, they were sending them out on a missionary service trip to go and to bring souls into the kingdom of heaven. They were to give the wedding invitation, come to the feast. In Matthew chapter, chapter 10 and verse 11, it says, Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there until you go out. So go and find, again, a worthy person who will, receive, who will uh, be willing to hear you. Now again, what makes this person worthy? Comparing Scripture with Scripture, go over with me to Luke. Luke chapter 10. And when Jesus was giving the instruction to the um, 70 of the, of the disciples to go out again on a missionary service trip. In Luke chapter 10, this is what makes an individual worthy um, to come to the banquet table. Luke chapter 10 and verse 8 and 9, it says, Whatever city you enter and they receive you, 
eat such things as are set before you and heal their sick and say to them, the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. Come to the wedding feast. Come. Now, what makes these people worthy is that they receive the message. They received the message. It was really nothing that they did. It wasn't some great thing, some great pilgrimage they made or some puppy that they rescued from the gutter. It wasn't some righteous or beautiful thing, but is that they received the message into their life. And they said, yes. Yes, I need Jesus too. I need Jesus in my life. We need to fill the banquet table, don't we, Lockie? Can you grab another rope? And we need to invite some more people. We need this banquet table to be filled. Is there anybody else that may receive, receive this uh, invitation? Well, go down here. And Maya, I know, if you just speak to her gently, I'm sure she'll receive the invitation. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Maya. Oh, you got a really nice robe, this one. Isn't that nice fabric? I think it used to be a sheet. But this here. Oh, yeah, there you go. Thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, you can take your seat at the table. Thank you. In Matthew chapter... 22, carrying on there from verse 9. Matthew chapter 22, carrying on with our parable. It says, Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you, as you find, invite them to the wedding. So the servants, they went out into the highways, and they gathered together all whom they found, both the bad and the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. All right, Lockie, we need to fill this, this hall right up. We should have another robe in there. Let's go ahead and grab one more robe. Is there two more? Oh, that's good. We have at least two more seats to fill. So do you have one robe there? Yeah, yeah good. All right. Let's go. I think Monty Paula. I can sense that she's wanting to come to the, she's the second row here. You go and invite Monty Paula. She's going to come to the wedding feast as well. Thank you, Mani Paula. Thank you for receiving the invitation to come to the wedding feast. Let's put your robe, Christ's robe of righteousness on you. And this will make you worthy to sit at the banquet table. Oh, great. You can have a seat there. You know, many people have come to me and said, you know, it really doesn't matter, you know, if, if I have faith in God or if I live a Christian experience and a Christian walk, you know, surely if I am just a good person, God will look on me and say, yeah, yeah, he's a decent fella, and I'll be able to talk my way out of it in the end and, and to wheel and deal my way into heaven if it's real. And surely then, then God, if he just looks on me and sees all the good things, he'll say, yeah, come on in. Now, Emily, will you come to the wedding feast? Oh, Oh, she has some attire on. I'll let you take a seat there anyways for now, and we're going to carry on with the narrative. Oh, thanks, Emily, for coming. But the Bible says, carrying on in verse 11, but when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment stand out, don't they? So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the Bible says that he was speechless. It says all that come before God, all mouths will be stopped. There is no excuse. Revelation, or Romans chapter 3, 19. There's no excuse for sin. There's no excuse that we can make and say, oh, I should have, I could have. There's no excuse that's enough. And I'm sorry, Emily, because you tried to come on your own free will and you tried to, sorry, you had to come on your own ambition saying that your works were enough and that your deeds were enough to allow you into the banquet hall. 
it's not enough. Because you're trying to purchase a garment that was already purchased by the blood of Jesus. She's trying to come in and saying that, Jesus, my garment's better than yours. That my deeds are better than your righteous deeds and it's enough to allow me entrance into heaven. So I'm sorry, Emily. You're going to have to go back and sit down. It says, Then the king said to the serpent, Bind him hand and foot. We're not going to do that. Take him away and cast him into darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. We can't come to God recommending him our good works because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 that our righteousness, all of our righteous deeds, they're like filthy rags. And if you do a careful and a word study on what those filthy rags there are, it is to the nth degree literally means filthy rags. I'm not talking about a little rag that you mopped up a little bit of water on the floor. Like this is a a filthy rag, and I'm not going to go into the gross details, actually, that the Bible describes there of those filthy rags. Is That's what our righteous deeds are like. Can I have that filthy rag? Yeah, thank you. They're, they're, they're hideous looking. They're, they're putrid. And they're disgusting. And we like to say, God, surely this would be enough to allow me entrance into heaven. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, go with me over there. Philippians chapter 3. This has always been the requirement for entrance into heaven. Always have, always will be. And it says in Philippians 3 and verse 9, it says, And to be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is like a filthy rag, which is from the law, but that, the, that which is thought, that, uh, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is in Him, from God, by faith. That by believing in what Christ has done, in His good works, in His righteousness, that alone is what saves us. That alone. Christ has already provided the invitation. He has already provided the ticket. He's already provided the robe to give you entrance into heaven. And we scoff at him. We laugh at him. We jeer at him and say, you know what? My deeds are enough. But it's never enough. It's never enough. Christ has purchased the ticket. I'm going to tell you a story about a New Zealand shepherd. And this shepherd, he loved his sheep. And that, but there was a particular day. It started like this. At the beginning of his day, he was extremely happy. At the middle of his day, he was utterly devastated and very sad. And at the end of the day, he was extremely happy again. You ever had a day like that? That you go from being so happy to just hitting the ground rock bottom to being happy again. And this is how his day went, that shepherd. Two of his U's, U-A and U-B, they both had a lamb. He was so happy. He was so thrilled that now his little flock was growing, that lambs were being born. So A, lamb A had a baby, so we'll call that big A has a little A, little A is born. Big B lamb, big B uh, sheep has little B that is born. But at the middle of the day, this is what led to the shepherd being very sad because you see, Mama B over here, she grew ill and died which left orphaned Lamb B, right? Now, sadly over here, the day is it's just getting worse because Lamb A dies, leaving Mama A sad because she has no baby. So as farmers try to do when these, these sad things happen, the farmer tries to take Lamb B and put it on Sheep A 
and tried to get it to suck, right? To join these two together. But the ewe would not receive this lamb. Wouldn't have a bar of it. So what did he have to do? He had to take lamb B that was dead. And he took the skin off it. He skinned it. And he placed it over lamb. You get the picture, right? We took the dead animal, his skin. My wife warned me that this could happen. But you get the picture. He takes the dead animals, the baby lamb, puts it on the living lamb. And then its mother was willing to receive it. Emily, can I have you come forward again? All our righteousness is like filthy lags. And Lockie, can we get another robe out? We want Emily to come into the feast. And though righteous deeds may follow, thank you, Lockie, because of our faith in Christ, the only thing that saves us, it is Christ's righteousness. You can have a seat at the table. That lamb was received by its mother because it had the right clothes. Jesus has already provided the right, the white raiment. And don't worry because you you don't have enough money. You don't have enough pennies in your bank to pay for it. There's never enough. But expressing faith and saying, yes, Jesus, I need you. I need you to cover me. And only by faith in Jesus are we then able to be saved and given entrance into heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll close with these two last passages here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 21, the Bible tells us that for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He took away our sinful deeds, and we were given the life that God deserves, and He received what we deserved, death on a cross. And finally, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the banquet table except through Jesus. So whatever route or whatever journey you may be on today, the only way is with Jesus. By confessing faith in Jesus, by inviting Jesus into your life today and tomorrow and the next day, just saying, God, I need you to dwell in me. I need you to fill me. I need you to saturate me. And it is only by God's grace that we will be saved and given entrance to sit at the heavenly banquet table. Friend, do you want to be at that banquet table? Do you guys want to be there? I know they do. Lockie, do you want to be there? I know you do. Let's close with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for that the wedding invitation was sent out. And though some have mocked and some scorned, and they said, I can't come because I'm too busy. I got this on. I got that on. But Father, you were persistent in sending that message out. And we're thankful for the faithful servants, like Lockie, and the faithful messengers that have gone out to make sure that your banquet table is full. So Lord, we pray that you help us to be active in that service of inviting people to your banquet table in heaven. Also, Lord, we pray for the blood of Jesus to cover us again of our sin. We plead for the, the robe of Christ's righteousness to cover us because that is the only way that we will be able to be granted entrance. So we thank you for that, that you've made it available and you've made it easy. But we recognize that it was not easily made. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, we're going to sing, When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. You guys look so good up there, but you can go sit down if you like now. Thank you, Lockie. If you want to stay up here and sing with me, you can. He's such a willing fellow. Thank you.